Come on in, Covenant. I'm glad you're here. Let me pray for us. Our God, we are thankful that your grace is not an abstraction, but a concrete reality in our lives and in the lives of your people and your world. We thank you that you care not simply for how we emotionally feel, you care about justice. For you are a righteous God. You are a God of the orphan and the widow, of the mighty and the weak. As you call the mighty to be made low and the weak to be exalted in your glory and grace. But our God, these realities are foreign to us. They offend us. They are not what we are used to. So would you give us grace to see power and weakness, to see strength and humility. Give us creativity and love and give us energy and action that your good news might actually be good news for your world. We pray this in the name of our risen King. Amen. I don't have an extended introduction. I gave a longer one yesterday. I do have one thing in terms of what I mentioned yesterday because I think there was, uh, I was going quickly and something I said I want to make sure I'm clear about. In passing, I said that the goal here is not shame nor self-righteousness. Someone appropriately said to me, what's so wrong about shame? Well, let me tell you what's wrong, at least in terms of psychology. And we can debate this in terms of uh, brothers and sisters from the East. There's a good argument to, to debate how Westerners understand shame, but in our context, Psychologists will often highlight the fact that what the problem with shame is all it does is paralyze people and make them feel bad and then the sin goes dark and we hide. And the argument is in the Christian tradition we're not about shame, we're about guilt. Because the evidence is guilt, when you feel guilty, you want to do something about it. And in the grace of the gospel, we can be made aware of our real guilt, seeking God's forgiveness and grace, and then empowered by his spirit, we go about the work of his kingdom. That's what I'm interested in. That's what we're interested in. So. Today, we have the last in our series from our special guest, Jamar Tisby. As you know, uh, a graduate of Notre Dame, RTS Jackson, currently finishing, uh, working to finish his PhD, University of Mississippi, his new book, The Color of Compromise, coming out in January. He is the president of The Witness, uh, a black Christian collective. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Jamar Tisby. Well, I've been here a day and a half, so I feel like I can be brutally honest with you because we're close friends now, right? And I'll just confess to you that I truly wrestled with this lecture for a few reasons. And I'll get at this by talking about my book. I know it seems kind of cheesy, but there's, there's, this, this to me is, is more than just words on a page. It's actually the fruit of a burden. So I got interested in history because of Ferguson and Black Lives Matter. As we were, as a nation, discussing these events and wherever you fall on who was to blame or, or, or where the responsibility lies, I was trying to figure things out too. And what I found was that historians had the most helpful things to say because they talked about the context that led to something like Ferguson. They talked about how 
the police force got military style guns and equipment. They talked about how a community like Ferguson comes to be predominantly black and poor. They talked about how this was a national story, not just one community's story. So I started reading more history. I took a, a graduate course, a master's course in history. And it was just to sort of learn more about it. But when I did, I was gripped by the realities I was learning about. Decided to get a doctorate in history. And when you do that, you take all these classes and you read all these books. And since my interest is in race and religion, I was reading a lot about race and religion. If you read about race and religion, the story is more often than not a tragic one. We like to skip over the tragedy and say, well, that was then, but then we had the civil rights movement and everything's better now. Well, I wrestled with this talk because I'm used to giving some more like happy-go-lucky, let's focus on the good news of the gospel and how everything's okay in the end. But I wonder if we don't self-sabotage our efforts at justice by not dwelling more with the pain, with the suffering. Because what happened in the past, number one, continues to affect us today, and number two, it happened to real people. And so this book is actually birthed out of a burden because I couldn't bear the weight of the tragedy and the sadness alone. I was reading story after story of, of the Middle Passage and people dying overboard. One, one thing that stuck out to me was that sharks would follow the slave ships because when people died, they'd dump the body overboard and the sharks would scavenge the corpses. I read about the lynching of Mary Turner, which happened 100 years ago this year. She protested the lynching of her husband, who himself had done nothing wrong, but was swept up in a white racist mob's rage at something someone else had done. And when she dared to speak up, when she dared to get a warrant for their arrest, because everybody knew who did the lynching, she herself was lynched. She was tracked down, hung by her ankles from a tree, doused with kerosene, and lit on fire that did not kill her. One thing that stands, about, stands out about Mary Turner's lynching is that she was eight months pregnant at the time. The butchers used a knife that they typically use to slaughter pigs, cut open her womb, the baby fell out, gave two whimpering cries before one person crushed its skull. Do you know that between 1918 and 2018, over 200 anti-lynching bills have been proposed in Congress, not a single one has passed. So I think about these realities, and I don't want to just jump to everything's going to be okay in the end. Because everything wasn't okay then, and everything's not okay now. And if we don't recognize the pain and the tragedy of racism, which always, always, always ends up in physical brutality, we will not have the right solution. You're going to go hopping and skipping into a problem that will consume you and you will do harm as you go. So, the point of this talk is simple. I want you to be activists. I want you to recognize that as Christians, your cause is the cause of justice. When you signed up to follow Jesus, you signed up to pursue justice particularly racial justice. So this talk has a couple of parts. And what I hope you walk away with is a challenge, but a sober challenge, a grown-up challenge. I'm going to talk about the fierce urgency of now, why this problem cannot be put off until tomorrow. I'm going to talk about the racial moderate. It's a category most of us fall into. We're not actively racist, but we're kind of tepid, lukewarm when it comes to pursuing justice. 
And I want to talk about where we go from here, being, as King called, extremists for love. So, in August of 1963, Martin Luther King Jr. delivered his famous I Have a Dream speech. Most people remember the line about not being judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. But there's another portion of the speech that I think remains relevant today. Toward the beginning, he says, we have also come to this hallowed spot to remind America of the fierce urgency of now. This is no time to engage in the luxury of cooling off or to take the tranquilizing drug of gradualism. Now is the time to make real the promises of democracy, he said. Now that was 1963. And here we are, 55 years later, and the question is, how far have we come? As a nation, we've taken down the signs saying whites only and no Negroes allowed, but our schools remain segregated. People of color are incarcerated at disproportionately higher rates. Black people have a unemployment rate that remains about double of white people. And when it comes to opposing racism, have Americans and more specifically Christians, have we overdosed on what King called the tranquilizing drug of gradualism? My point this morning is that given the fact that the American church in the Reformed tradition has been complicit in racism, then a racial formation, reformation today must include actions to promote civil rights and justice. In other words, the church has missed it so often in the past that it has demolished credibility with people of color and with non-Christians, because so often not only did we compromise with injustice, oftentimes we promoted it. So if we are to see racial unity, diversity, equity, inclusion today, then it must include justice. And yet, we remain stuck in 2018 because, by and large, vast segments of the American church, particularly the white church, fails to recognize the systemic and institutional aspects of racism. The facts that the courts and the legal system were designed to oppress and not liberate black people in many instances. I want to walk through a couple examples and my question with all of these examples is, where was the church? Now, immediately you might be thinking, well, there are always exceptions. And there are. Quakers, Moravians, different branches of the church. But in terms of the broad church and the identity of the American church, where were we? So, even written into the Constitution there was a sort of waffling, to put it nicely, on slavery. Article 4, Section 2, Clause 3, a.k.a. the Fugitive Slave Clause, said that if a slave escaped and crossed state lines, then that slave could be caught and returned to his or her owner. Now, what's interesting is they never used the word slave or slavery, but it said, quote, persons held to service or labor meant a slave, and that's in the Constitution. What that meant, practically speaking, was that even as a black person, if you were brave enough, creative enough, and fortunate enough to escape the plantation, then somebody could capture you and send you right back. And do you know what would await you? At a minimum, torture, perhaps death. Why? Because you had the audacity not to want to work for someone else and be considered property. Where was the church? The Dred Scott case of 1857. Dred, Dred Scott sued his slave owner for freedom because he had lived with his owner as a servant in free states in the north. So Scott's figuring, well, I'm in a free state. I should be considered free. And so he sued for his freedom, but the outcome the court decided that black people 
were not even citizens. Therefore, they could not pursue legal action in the courts. So what's interesting about this, they didn't even argue Dred Scott's case in terms of, if I'm a slave in a free state, can I be free? They just said, you know what? Black people are property, not citizens, so you have no right to sue people. Diminishing the image of God. Plessy v. Ferguson in 1896. In this court case, the infamous separate but equal principle was affirmed by the Supreme Court, a decision later reversed in Brown v. Board in 1954 that said segregation was inherently unequal, but for more than 50 years, racial segregation was the law of the land. Where was the church? In my first talk, I, I showed you the, the, the speech given by G.T. Gillespie in 1954 in response to the court's order of desegregation. And what was the response of some Reformed Christians was to argue from the Bible that segregation was the proper way. And we could go on and on. In the 20th century, the New Deal, which was restricted mainly to white men, housing discrimination, over-policing uh, of poor areas, on and on and on and on. Where was the church? So often we have followed society instead of leading society when it comes to racial justice. And you know what happens? Is we get labeled hypocrites. What happens is when Christian leaders, especially white reformed and evangelical leaders, start talking, people of color don't believe them. Because we've had centuries where the church could have intervened for the sake of the human dignity of other people and instead cooperated with injustice. Frederick Douglass, who was a slave and escaped to freedom, put it this way. He wrote his autobiography, and throughout his autobiography, he was very critical of American Christianity. But Frederick Douglass himself was a Christian. And so he put in the appendix an explanation to say, listen, I've been really critical of a certain type of Christianity. This is what he said. What I have said respecting and against religion, I mean strictly to apply to the slaveholding religion of this land, and with no possible reference to Christianity proper. For between the Christianity of this land and the Christianity of Christ, I recognize the widest possible difference. So wide that to receive the one as good, pure, and holy is of necessity to reject the other as bad, corrupt, and wicked. I love the pure, peaceable, and impartial Christianity of Christ. I therefore hate the corrupt, slave-holding, women-whipping, cradle-plundering, partial, and hypocritical Christianity of this land. Indeed, I can see no reason but the most deceitful one for calling the religion of this land Christianity. What happens when the church fails to fight for justice? We lose our witness. And marginalized people and oppressed people of all kinds see the hypocrisy of saying we love God, but demonstrating no tangible, material love for our brothers and sisters. It's not about good feelings. It's about fighting the systems that create the pressure that pushes people down and out in society. And Frederick Douglass put it well. Now here's the thing. I would presume most people in this room are not racist actively. It's not that you don't like people who look different or come from a different culture. That's not the problem. You're not opposed to black civil rights. You're not opposed to justice. The problem with many of us American Christians is that we don't want civil rights and justice to be costly. We don't want to sacrifice for the sake of righteousness. 
So what happens is we say we want these good things for ourselves and other people, but we try to pursue them in a moderate way. But I'd like to propose to you that moderation, when it comes to injustice, is not a virtue. Moderation with food, sugar, those kinds of things, that's good. But moderation when it comes to sin? I don't think that's a virtue. In Martin Luther King Jr.'s letter from a Birmingham jail, one of the most well-known parts is where he critiques the white moderate. I've actually changed it a little bit to be the racial moderate, because as I'll explain in a moment, there were black people who were moderates as well. But here's the passage from the letter. He said, I must make two honest confessions to you, my Christian and Jewish brothers. First, I must confess that over the past few years, I have been gravely disappointed with the white moderate. I have almost reached the regrettable conclusion that the Negro's great stumbling block in his stride toward freedom is not the white citizen's counselor or the Ku Klux Klaner, but the white moderate who is more devoted devoted to, quote, order than to justice who prefers a negative peace, which is the absence of tension, to a positive peace, which is the presence of justice. The moderate who constantly says, I agree with the goal you seek, but I cannot agree with your methods or direct action. Who paternalistically believes he can set the timetable for another person's freedom who lives by a mythical concept of time and who constantly advises the Negro to wait for a more convenient season. Shallow understanding from people of goodwill is more frustrating than absolute misunderstanding from people of ill will. Lukewarm acceptance is much more bewildering than outright rejection. I've experienced this numerous times in predominantly white churches and denominations. The election, and I'm not telling you to be Democrat or Republican, I'm simply describing the impact on many people of color and my own experience. Leading up to the November 2016 election, you had people of all kinds, from black people to women to refugees to immigrants to any kind of marginalized group you can think about, practically screaming that the rhetoric they were hearing, the words and the language they were seeing were going to be bad. Now this struck me particularly because I go around to churches all around the country and talk about racial reconciliation, and to my face, everyone was, rah, rah, yeah, that's great, let's get everybody together. But when it came to our voices being heard, it sounded like our presence made no difference whatsoever. It felt like a lukewarm acceptance, which was more bewildering than an outright rejection. You see, the extremists are easy to spot, aren't they? This remains our image of a racist. The Ku Klux Klan, burning crosses, bombing churches and killing little girls. If that's our only definition of racism, then we've missed it. We've missed the racial moderate. Most people are not that extreme. Most people are much more reasonable than those kinds of racists. So it becomes easy to point the finger at the most extreme forms of racial terror and say, those are the real racists. But King troubles those waters. He says that extremists present a clear and present danger, but the most harmful enemy is the one you thought would be your friend the people who are more devoted to order than to justice. So they fear protests and demonstrations, not because of the protesters, but because of the violence or the breaking of the law. The moderates who prefer a negative peace rather than a positive, negative peace rather than a positive peace of justice. In biblical terms, they are the ones who preach peace, peace when there is no peace. Moderates who paternalistically believe they can set the timetable for freedom, the ones who advise caution and a gradual approach to addressing injustice rather than stopping the evil right now. What's so interesting is that King 
in his letter from a Birmingham jail was responding to a letter that he received. Now we always pay attention to King's letter. I think it's interesting to pay attention to the letter from the racial moderates. Listen, they said, we recognize the natural impatience of people who feel that their hopes are slow in being realized. They said, we formally pointed out that hatred and violence have no sanction in our religious and political tradition. They said, when rights are consistently denied, a cause should be pressed in the courts and in negotiations among local leaders, not in the streets. What stands out is that these racial moderates are so reasonable. These are not foaming at the mouth racists. What they're advising King is work it through the courts. You know what the courts did? Courts did Dred Scott. Courts did Plessy v. Ferguson. Courts failed to convince, convict white lynchers. They failed to recognize that the courts didn't work, in other words. And they were advising gradualism because they didn't like the marches. They didn't like the fire hoses and the dogs and the picketing and the boycotting. But there was nothing else that was working. And so King said the moderates are, are actually our stumbling block in the stride toward freedom. Now a word on black moderates because it's not just white people. Not all black people or black Christians appreciated Martin Luther King's brand of direct action protest. For instance, in 1961, King had to leave his denomination, the National Baptist Convention, which is the largest black Baptist denomination, and help form the PNBC, which stands for Progressive National Baptist Convention, a denomination that was supportive of vigorous public protest and instigating confrontation through nonviolent means in order to change unjust laws. So even King faced opposition from other black Christians. Historians estimate that maybe at the high end, 10% of black churches were actually involved in the civil rights movement actively. Many others may have su supported it directly by providing verbal or perhaps financial support, but make no mistake, not all black Christians were out marching in the streets. Ministered were ministers, black ministers, were often the most educated and financially stable members of the black community, and they had a lot to lose if they angered white people. So there is such a thing as a black racial moderate both then and now. But let's go back to the Bible. It strikes me that when Jesus was talking to religious folk, he was sometimes very harsh. When he was talking to religious folk, he sometimes gave really, really sharp warnings. For instance, in, in uh, Matthew 23, he says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you build the tombs of the prophets and decorate the monuments of the righteous, saying, If we had lived in the days of our fathers, we would not ta have taken part with them in the shedding the blood of the prophets. In other words, they think they're righteous because they're religious. What if we applied that to race and justice? What if we exercised a little creativity and thought about what Jesus might say to the church in America when it comes to race and justice? What if Matthew 23 were to read, Woe to you, reformed Christians and racial moderates, hypocrites! For you hold immense to commemorate civil rights activists and read books about the martyrs of anti-racism saying, if we had lived during the civil rights movement, we would not have taken part with the racists in shedding the blood of the protesters. Thus you witness against yourselves that you are sons and daughters of those who murdered Martin Luther King Jr. Fill up then the measure of your slaveholding and segregationist fathers and mothers. You racists, you racial moderates, how are you to escape being sentenced to hell? Therefore, I send you social justice warriors and community organizers and activists, some of whom you will put in jail and lynch, and some you will call Marxists in your churches and troll on social media, so that, you may, so that on you may come all the righteous blood shed on earth, from the blood of the righteous Medgar Evers to the blood of Emmett Till, the son of Mamie Till Mobley, whom you lynched in Mississippi.'" 
Truly, I say to you, all these things will come upon this millennial and Gen Z generation. What if Christ is speaking those words to us? What if the word that we need to hear right now is not a word of comfort, but a word of woe? Today in 2018, more than half a century after King's letter from a Birmingham jail, we must ask ourselves, do we sense the fierce urgency of now? Are we the racial moderates of today? We must view civil rights activism and justice as part of the modern racial reformation. So what do we do? In King's letter from a Birmingham jail, he talks about becoming an extremist for love. King said, and now this approach, civil disobedience, is being termed extremist, but though I was initially disappointed at being categorized as an extremist, as I continued to think about the matter, I gradually gained a measure of satisfaction from the label. Was not Jesus an extremist for love? Love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. We need to move from being racial moderates to extremists for love. But I hesitate to give practical steps because honestly, I don't think we have a problem of how to, but a problem of want to. You know you can Google. You know you can figure out what to do to fight racism and to promote justice. And yet with all of us, black people, white people, and everyone else, there's a tendency to retreat back into what is comfortable. Because I will tell you this, being comfortable and fighting for justice tend to be mutually exclusive. If comfort is your goal, then just don't even pretend that you want to fight for justice. Just let us know where you are. If justice is your goal, then prepare to be uncomfortable. And I know the feeling. I still don't consider myself an activist. Although I've tried to take risks for the cause of justice. I know what it's like. The only thing I can tell you is here's where faith comes in. Jesus said, I'll be with you. But you cannot believe that promise unless you go to where he sends you. I can tell you that Jesus has become more real to me since I've taken risks for racial justice than I ever knew possible. So I'm, I'm, here's, here's the good news. If you want to taste the sweetness of Jesus more than you ever had before, then risk for the sake of justice. You know why? Because when you get the comments on social media, when you get in the argument with your parents or family members, when people label you as a progressive or a Marxist, Jesus is right there with you. And it's only on the other side of that persecution for the sake of justice that you even start to know what Jesus is promising you. It's when your prayers start to get really powerful because you feel desperate. It's when your heart truly breaks because you're actually loving people to the point where you're risking your own well-being for them. And so I have nothing to give you but the promise that Jesus gave all of us in the Bible. That he will never leave you and he will never forsake you. But if you think you're walking with Jesus and you haven't risked much, then, then it's only a shadow of the presence that you can experience. So what I'm doing is I'm calling you into a deeper experience of Christ through the pursuit of justice. Now there's a lot of practical steps and I'm glad to talk about those. I'll stick around for a few more minutes. But I'll end with this. We talked about grief at the beginning, or guilt at the beginning. I think guilt can be good. We got a linguist professor in the house, so forgive my loose language. But there's something called like, let me talk to the white students for a moment. There's something called white guilt, which may not be healthy. Because that kind of guilt is fundamentally self-centered. 
Guilt means you feel bad that your own self-image is more negative than you thought. You feel guilty that you did something wrong. You want to fix it, but not for the sake of someone else. You want to fix it so that you feel better about yourself. What I hope is that we experience what I talked about in the first talk, godly grief. Godly grief recognizes your own part in injustice and you feel that that guilt, but your grief is also because you've done harm to someone else. Their pain is the priority. I don't want you to experience guilt, not white guilt, but grief, godly grief. But you're in a good position here at Covenant to do something. I haven't been with you long, but I've had deep experiences, long conversations with faculty and administration, sat in on a couple classes this morning that was wonderful. And what I observed is that you can take advantage of your liberal arts education. Dr. Wyke wrote, Dr. Corbett, Dr. Jackson, Dr. Green, Dr. Caput, staff like Christiana Fitzpatrick, your administrators and so many others take their classes, go to their office hours because they're thinking about the right things. Use this season to learn and to become aware and to get involved if you possibly can. You have all you need here. And I'll leave you with this. Your, your motto is, in all things Christ preeminent. To answer all these questions about race and justice, you have it right there in those few words. How do we do this? Why do we do this? Because in all things, Christ preeminent. Thank you. Protect us even from self-centered guilt. Help us to glory in your cross and resurrection, that we might be about your kingdom, the good of others. We thank you for your love and your grace. Be with us this day and in this season. In Christ's name, amen. Be free.